I'm your host Ashish Lewis here as you know and uh, Ink Feathers Events is here with this webinar for you enjoy sit back and i hope there's a lot of things for you to take away today we'll start with uh, kanal krishna rao hi how are you kanal hello uh, hi kashish thank you so much for calling me uh, inviting me for this uh, webinar you have a host of uh, terrific speakers i'm pretty sure everybody will be awake till for the full two and a half hours <laughs> anyway um uh thanks to anush and ink feathers uh thank you for publishing my book my recently released book yesterday's train to nowhere and uh it's come out beautifully thank you so much and uh, without much uh, further ado i'm going to start my presentation i will be speaking on uh, mental stress and effects of a childhood of a child's illness on the parents i will be taking not more than uh, 10 to 12 minutes I'd be happy to answer your questions thereafter. And uh, I have been, uh, uh, after my stint in the army, I have been teaching in various medical colleges and also treating children with cancer and blood disorders. So you can well imagine what kind of a diagnosis that is for a parent to listen to. And uh, they do undergo a lot of stress. And I'll just try and um, tell you my personal experiences and uh, let's go ahead so i'm going to share my screen right now um, okay so the first thing which happens is why is there stress when parents when the child falls sick why do the parents undergo stress and the most obvious reason is it's a severely emotive issue i mean you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand that if the child falls sick the parents are definitely under a lot of pressure. It's a severely emotional issue. A little child who can't look after him or herself and the parents are the sole caregivers and everything what they do, what they decide to do for the child is what it is for the child. There's nobody else taking decisions in this regard. So highly emotional. The second reason is today we've come into a kind of a nuclear family setting. Earlier there used to be joint families, 10 to 15 children running around, one less, one more. Uh, you know, people probably would never realize the importance of having a joint, joint family. But today, everything is nuclear. There's a mother, there's a father, there's maybe one, maybe two children. And it becomes uh, very, very more uh, focused, you know, the attention of the parents on those two children. Right. The third is, to some extent, that is still there in this country. There is some amount of gender bias. And this gender bias affects mainly uh, the female child. I'm sorry to say that, but most of our admissions in hospitals for cancer treatment happen to be boys. Uh, South India is a little more, uh, shall I say, a little more aware of these things than North India. The, the ratio equals out somewhat in South India, but still there is a significant bias towards the male gender. And then you have financial constraints. It's not easy to fall sick. It's not cheap to fall sick these days. You fall sick, you need to have a lot of uh, money to get well. And that certainly affects the parental health. I mean, when you give them a diagnosis of cancer, maybe the second question they ask or the third question they ask is how much is it going to cost? And that's, that's terrible. That's really terrible because uh, in a situation like this, um, we need to do everything we can because Childhood cancer is curable. It's absolutely curable. We have success rates of 80%, uh, 85% in most institutions. And if the child doesn't get that kind of treatment, he requires just because they don't have the money, that's a tragedy. And then finally, there is a lot of guilt precipitated by family and peer pressure. You know, the, uh, I'll come to that a little later, but definitely the parents are under a lot of pressure. Why didn't you go here? Why do you go there? Why do you go to this? institution why didn't you go to that institution you know? so these are the reasons why the parents are under emotive uh, stress a lot of stress when the child falls next is when do they fall sick what is the time when they fall uh, when they have a lot of mental pressure and the number one is the duration of illness if it's an acute illness of the child the pressure is not so much they get over it within maybe three to five days child becomes sick they are of course very concerned very very concerned but then the stress uh, levels come down the moment the child 
starts recovering and most childhood illnesses um, most of them the acute illnesses take about 3 to 5 years to recover so it's not too bad if the mother and father share the burden of looking after the child um, it's not too bad the problem comes in chronic illnesses of the child where the child is sick for a long period of time and then it becomes more difficult the second of course is a type of illness if it's an acute infectious illness unless it's associated with significant mortality like what we had with covid then the stress levels are more but otherwise acute illnesses usually the stress levels are much less than a terminal or a fatal or a chronic illness especially to give them a diagnosis of cancer or a incurable blood disorder yes definitely the uh, stress levels are much more than in an acute illness and then of course you have the severity of the illness the mild illnesses usually don't really affect the parents but sometimes the mild illnesses become major and that's where the problem occurs that's where the stress level suddenly increase everything was going fine and then doctor suddenly you told us that the child is now critically ill it does happen you know it does happen and uh, that's where the stress levels go and then you have the cost factors and this is where you have the stress insured patients don't have too much of stress as far as uh, this aspect is concerned but non insured parents all the time worried how they going to raise the money to look after the child's illness and then you have a lot of guilt have i looked after the child well did the child fall sick because of my uh, um, lack of empathy or did i did the child fall sick because i i went out to enjoy myself um or somebody else tells the parents hey, you didn't look after the child well if, you, if the child was with me at home usually it's the grandparents who put this pressure on the on the parents who say hey, you didn't look after the child properly it's because of you the child has fallen sick and it's it's pretty sad and it's not that the grandparents want to do that they are also under stress and uh, you know one must realize that this stress is not just limited to parents it's limited to the whole family it's you know extends to the whole family right what are the five stages of parental reaction to a chronic or a life threatening illness this is something which i would like you all to understand and all of you to remember the when the doctor calls the parents and gives them the first counseling regarding the child the first initial reaction of the parents is disbelief straight away doctor you made a mistake please look at it again 30 to 50% of your patients will go away at this stage they will want to go and get a second opinion and then go to another hospital to another doctor to take a second opinion right so this is the first stage of uh, parental reaction to a child's illness the second stage is anger why me i mean i did everything i was such a good god fearing person i never harmed anybody why me and that's where you have the anger the third is guilt what did i do wrong that is the stage third stage of parental reaction to a child's illness the fourth is anxiety now what's going to happen doctor what are you going to do and the fifth is acceptance what do we do next right and for my uh, colleagues in the medical profession i always tell them the faster you bring the parents down to acceptance what do we do next your life becomes much easier because the first four stages are very very difficult to handle as far as we in the medical profession are concerned so this is the five stages of parental reaction to a child's illness what can happen if these issues are not addressed you know it doesn't uh, it's not always that parents come to somebody for counseling or come to somebody for help if these issues are not addressed you have two types of acute stress uh, two types of stress the first is acute stress this is an acute stress and this may happen very early in the uh, after you giving the diagnosis for the child and that can lead to dissatisfaction against the hospital caregivers and the family and this often includes leads to violence so what you read in the newspapers about you know how a hospital got vandalized and how the doctors got beaten up and all that is somewhere around this stage where there is an acute stress reaction to something which is uh, troubling the parents or something which is deeply affecting the parents and then that can also lead to a little later it can lead to legal action they feel that you've not done your job properly it can lead to all kinds of uh, you know uh, legal uh, action and then if you if the parents internalize this this is the time when 
one of them may even commit suicide you know this is the very uh, critical uh, time of um, uh, the issue when you need to understand that acute stress can cause any one of this right and if you actually look into the causes of that you find that this is seen more in the male members of the family rather than the female members so acute stress affects the parents early and it's usually the father the male member of the family who is affected more than the mothers in acute stress the other kind of stress which you get is chronic stress and this chronic stress may lead to two uh, problems one is it can lead to physical disease actual physical disease it can lead to coronary artery disease ischemic heart disease as was mentioned by stark in his very very illuminating paper in 1978 and then it can lead to hypertension romano described this in 1980 that is high blood pressure then it can lead to poor blood sugar control in diabetics which was extensively elaborated by michel in 1980 and it can also cause abnormal weight loss or abnormal weight gain especially in the mothers there could also be severe menstrual issues in the mother and wonders of wonders it can actually cause a relapse of previously cured cancer this does happen because the immunity does come down as you might have guessed so far by the uh, the photo in the in this slide chronic stress affects uh, chronic stress affects uh, the mothers more than the fathers chronic stress can also lead to mental illness all of this can happen chronic alcoholism and drug abuse anxiety depression suicidal tendencies and antisocial behavior all of this can occur when the child is sick more importantly uh, this was described by finch in 1979 uh, the mothers can and the parents can have extensive sleep disorders unable to sleep they can have somatization that is all kinds of vague illnesses can arise at this stage and they can even have post traumatic stress disorder which was mentioned recently that's what happens to soldiers in combat even that can happen in parents who have undergone a very traumatic uh, childhood illness uh, in their child and this is seen more in mothers as you can make up the chronic stress is seen more in mothers 15 to 20 percent more in mothers than in fathers it can last for more than a year in 20 to 25 percent of mothers even after the child has recovered from the illness or unfortunately has passed away this stress can last for one to two years after the incident so this has to be taken very seriously right so how do we manage this this issue it's it's important it's important to know that if you are able to manage this issue well Uh, you have the parents on your side it's as a doctor you find it very much more easier to treat these children right and i've been doing this for the last 20 25 years i've always tried to get the parents on my side because then it becomes much easier and the only way you can do that is by counseling so what exactly do you mean by counseling what is counseling counseling is a unique interactive communication process between the counselor and the client that leads to a change in behavior attitudes emotions and beliefs and believe me the last is the most difficult to change the most difficult to change you can you can alter behavior you can alter attitudes you can alter emotions but it's very very difficult to change beliefs all with the by tailoring the in intervention to the educational status of the parents and family please understand counseling has to be on a case to case parent to parent individual to individual basis it cannot be put into one you know straight jacket saying that everybody should be counseled like this because everything how counseling your the success of counseling will depend on how well you are able to communicate and communication depends on your educational status as well as the educational status of the recipient right so it's very important to tailor the counseling sessions to suit both the doctor as well as the as the parents right so you have to take into consideration the educational status of both parties before you get down to counseling what are the steps in counseling the first step is identify the problem there are times when the parents say i don't require counseling i'm perfectly all right doctor there's no need to counsel but then 
those are the parents who have internal manifestations of the stress and those internal manifestations would be sleep disorders hypertension and very poor blood sugar control some of them may even have angina that is you know a heart uh, ischemia of the heart or a problem in the heart all of this can happen but yet the person will say i don't require counseling i'm fine thank you doctor i don't require counseling so you have to identify these parents and identify the stress which they are undergoing and some of course will have external manifestations they would be tremulousness they would be very anxious they would be depressed and you could easily make that up so first of all in the steps in counseling is identify the problem the second is break down the stress into components and identify the main cause what exactly is the reason for the stress are they do they fear that the child will die or do they fear that they won't have any more children after this or do they fear that they don't have money to look after the child or look after the illness the child in the illness or they or do they feel that you know there is some guilt on their part so you have to identify what exactly is causing them the stress because once you know what is exactly the problem which is causing the stress you are able to handle it and you are able to address the issue third is alleviate the problem if possible by you know uh, speaking to people getting them some financial help counseling of the relatives to put less pressure on the parents all of this help all of the self these are all the ancillary methods by which we can reduce the stress of the parents and then improve motivation and hope and with that we improve the coping skills ultimately the the end result of counseling is to improve the coping skills of the parents nobody can take away that stress that stress will be there but you can just make these parents cope with that stress a little better right so what is motivation and hope how do you increase motivation and hope you talk about the disease and its behavior give them the best and the worst case scenarios right but never never give them false hopes false hopes is something which is not acceptable and it will bounce back later on in the day so talk to them about the disease talk to them about best case scenarios but do not give them false hopes second is give percentages 60% of the children have, have survived 80% have survived right now we don't know whether your child comes in the 20% or comes in the 80% but i'm sure with everybody's help with god's help your child will definitely be in the 80% but give yourself an an escape mechanism because if you say that the child is definitely going to be cured and the child does not do well there are times when you are not able to you not able to uh, ensure that the child does well uh, in that case then the parents will tell you next doctor you told me that everything was fine and yet you know we've had this problem so so give percentages but clarify the chances correctly be optimistic but not overly optimistic and that's especially true in pediatrics in childhood diseases in childhood diseases miracles happen every day in childhood diseases because these kids are able to bounce back much much better than uh, the the chronically ill adult and i have seen this with my own eyes there are times when i have given up children for good as gone and the next day i come back and i find that these fellows are jumping in their bed so uh, uh, it's 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 uh, uh, always be optimistic in pediatrics discuss costs and ways of raising funds if possible help them talk to the administrators try and do the best you can those who are insured or those who are in government institutions obviously do not have this problem but yet this is maybe at times they, they may be some problems as far as finances are concerned and then finally introduce the family to other parents with similarly affected children and survivors we used to have a, a cancer training program for the, um, the the children undergoing chemotherapy at present and we used to call twice a year we used to call all the survivors and their parents and we used to have a big party uh, you know and with song music once we even got a baby elephant for them to ride on and uh, it became a big issue and everybody was so happy but the most important thing is once you introduce a survivor or a survivor's parents to a parents a child's parents today what happens is they form support groups by themselves they start exchanging phone numbers and whenever there's a problem they bring up the person who's gone through this illness they say no don't worry this thing happens after chemotherapy they'll vomit very much and all that kind of thing so it's it's absolutely essential that you bring these children and their parents to meet with survivors and children who and parents who undergone this uh, this problem before and if possible i found this a great help bring in some spirituality into the discussion it it really soothes the nerves and helps the parents 
you may or may not believe in 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 the spiritual world that is not the issue here right? the issue is how much the parents believe in it and if you bring in spirituality into this discussion certainly it's going to help you uh, get across your point to the parents right okay so what are the additional few helpful tips one does not have to be a professional counselor to counsel please understand that please understand every human being is a counselor after all all it requires is you could require basic common sense to alleviate fear and anxiety when you were young your parents used to relieve your fear and anxiety were they counselors no so everybody is capable of relieving fear and anxiety and that's what a counselor does you may have to counsel repeatedly during the same illness that is one thing which you need to understand one counseling may not help you may have to counsel these parents repeatedly during the child's illness which what we used to do enlist the help of other family members to counsel the parents that would that would really help i used to catch hold of the elderly grandmother make her my friend and then make that grandmother speak to everybody in the family and once the grandmother says something nobody has the guts to say anything against her so i i used to love these grandmothers and you know make them my friends and even now i am uh, they they call me up once now i doctor how are you and what's going on so don't forget grandmothers okay and then do not get emotionally involved with the problem with the parents or with the child because if you get emotionally involved you will take wrong decisions so always keep your professional side away from your emotional and your involvement and seek a second person's help if the parents are resistant to counseling in case they are not able to uh, you are not able to counsel the parents it's always better to send them to somebody else who can in your department in somebody else i found this very very helpful sometimes i call somebody else to sit with me during the counseling session but the bottom line is be kind and gentle and the bottom line is do unto others as you would have them do unto you just remember that put yourself in your in their shoes and then you counsel you will be the perfect counselor you will be the perfect counselor if you put yourself in their shoes in the parent shoes so i'd like to conclude by saying that the child's illness can be very stressful on the mental and physical health of both parents fathers undergo acute stress mothers undergo chronic stress if they internalize it they get physical diseases if they externalize it they get mental diseases stress and its effects varies from illness to illness and in between families there are certain families which are very close knit they are able to support each other there are some which are not close knit these are the ones who have all the problems and require frequent counseling unaddressed this stress may lead to serious mental and physical health issues in the parents leading to what's important for me is leading to less than standard care being offered to the child if the parents are under stress they will not be able to look after the child properly after all you cannot be with the child 24 hours the parents are the ones who will be with the child 24 hours counseling is the best way to help parents cope with stress and its effects and there is lots and lots more about counseling but i have just kept it to a very bare minimum to get to and we owe it to others to help when we can it's as simple as that thank you very much i would i would love to have questions by the way this photograph is of the kanchenjunga which is the highest mountain in india and it's taken from the ninth floor of the sikkim manipal institute of medical sciences in tadung in gangtok so you can well uh, appreciate the majesty of this absolutely stunning mountain yes i would love to have questions from anybody thank you so much uh, kanal ra for that wonderful session it was very insightful everyone here if anybody has a question you you can unmute and go ahead ask your question if you're not comfortable unmuting then you can just type i think we already have one question all right uh, colonel i'll just uh, na- just narrate this out for you uma asks are there any things which either parent can help ensure during the mother's pregnancy to help prevent the possibility of the child developing cancer by at least 5% <laughs> if if i'm uh, am i on mute no if i'm able to answer that question i'll get the nobel prize <laughs> <laughs> all right no, so it's, it's it's difficult we tell the mothers not to undergo radiation we tell them not to take drugs we tell them not to as far as possible avoid uh, viral illnesses these are the three things which can affect the fetus especially in the first trimester the first trimester is when all the organs are being formed of the of the new baby 
and that's the time when we are especially careful so we tell uh, the parents not to under, undergo any x-ray or you know ct scan or anything like that we tell them to be absolutely 100% careful uh, taking uh, indiscriminate use of drugs and you know for a small headache you take aspirin and algin and all that kind of thing that should be totally totally restricted and of course try and avoid viral illnesses in case somebody else in the family has a viral illness just disappear from there and you know go and live somewhere else but these are the three things or four things which you know we but most of childhood cancers if you would like to know are genetically determined there are certain mutations which occur in the genes which come down from generations sometimes it occurs in the child's genes sometimes it occurs earlier as well in earlier generations and most of childhood cancers are genetically determined it just requires a small environmental second hit to precipitate the cancer so besides what i told you i don't think there's anything else uh, very much more which we can uh, do during pregnancy to prevent cancer the other important thing kuma which i would like to tell you is that in any pregnant mother when she starts thinking about pregnancy forget about when she becomes pregnant when she just starts thinking about pregnancy she must start a tablet called folic acid okay it's a 5 mg small tablet and it's taken to basically prevent any birth defects in the baby uh today earlier we used to say that it should be started in, as soon as the mother becomes pregnant but today our literature says that when the mother thinks of becoming pregnant she thinks that she may become pregnant in which case then you start the folic acid which prevents any birth defect which occurring but of course it doesn't prevent cancer but it prevents birth defects from occurring so that's that's an important uh, message i would like to uh, share with all of you here thank you for answering that question uh colonel we have two more questions we'll quickly take this yes yes so uh, one more by mr goel uh, he says thank you colonel rao for introducing us to the insights in this topic got to learn a lot so his question is how does medical professional uh, manage their mental physical stress while working with a number of patients and parents from case to case how do you personally manage your mental health as that's, you have to see so that, much that's, that's a terrific question uh, uh, for the simple reason that uh, when we enter the profession uh, we are 17 years old 17 18 years old uh, we really don't know what we are getting ourselves in we really don't know and by the time medical college is over we have hardly had a glimpse of patients from the from a very superficial glimpse of the parent of the patient so we don't really form a kind of an attachment to them but as we go along in the profession we realize that um that these people require your help and that's why you're wearing the white coat and that's why you're donning a stethoscope right and when you find out that somebody's need is greater than yours then you start giving that kind of uh, help which is required in the process it certainly affects you it certainly affects you uh, i i had so many children on chemotherapy my uh, success rate was around 80% uh, eight out of 10 children would survive two children would not and those two happened to be the cutest always happened to be the cutest uh, there are some children even now i can see them in front of my eyes and how they died but uh, you know somebody has to do it if if you don't do it somebody else will do it but somebody has to do it because these kids are falling sick and they are the ones who require all the help we can give so well <laughs> as a general as field marshal manikshan used to say bash on regardless that's it uh, leave your emotions behind don't get involved and carry on doing your work and making the correct decisions because there are certain times in this in the management of these children's illnesses where you will have to make decisions which can affect them very severely it's a matter of life and death and uh, hopefully by that time you would have the the divine guidance as well as the intelligence and the common sense to make that correct decision all right thank you so much uh one last question for you anurag certainly Certainly. This question is by Mr. Bhardwaj. He says, uh, in such situations, parents' dissatisfaction and wrath is usually hidden. As the partner and the parents even stop communicating to one another, what is the finest advice for parents to become each other's pillars? Terrific. 
Mr. Bhadra, that is a terrific question because this is frequently what we face. The moment you give the diagnosis of cancer to the parents, the father disappears, absolutely disappears. Doesn't come back home. He says he's under stress. I I'm sorry to say all this. He says that he's under stress and he disappears and leaves the mother with the baby. And the poor thing carries on and carries on and carries on with that little child doing everything she can, whatever is possible. And finally, after the child recovers totally from the illness and comes back to society, that's the time when the fa father will make a miraculous appearance. I have seen this happening so many times. I've seen this happening so many times. So th there is no solution for this. Um, there are times, the more educated the parents are, the less this will happen. But I have seen this very, very frequently. And it, it often happens that we counsel them together. We hold the father responsible. In fact, the first person to come and, you know, create a, a scene in the hospital, if something goes wrong, is the father. But he would not be seen anywhere near uh, when we require the help. In fact, uh, most of us, um, we tell our, our youngsters that when there is a huge crowd in the, in the, in the outpatient and everybody is shouting and screaming, the, the best thing to do is ask people to donate blood. And the moment you ask them to donate blood, everybody disappears, right? And then you, you can do your work uh, so easily. So there's a common thing which happens. The, the, exactly the correct thing is that the, the, between the father and the mother, the mother is the stronger of the two. She takes care of the child. She understands what you're trying to tell. I've never had a problem with the mother. It's usually the father who, you know, behaves abnormally and we have yet to find a solution to this problem. Thank you, Pan. I think that was the last of questions and uh, that was a great list of questions as well, as well as the answer was very spot on, very uh, practically answered, I would say. And again, that's quite insightful.